One of the most jarring adjustments that mathematics students have to make after completing the calculus sequence is to learn how to prove things. Trigonometry, basic algebra, and calculus are very much problem-based, where the objective is to either solve for a variable, graph a function, or say, take a derivative. There are routine steps to take with each problem, and there are a lot of problems that you can pull from. I mean, there are even problem generators online, if you want more practice. For a proof-based course, the landscape is very different. The objective is to prove theorems and propositions, and the pathways for problems seems much more ambiguous and completely different from each problem to the next. Mathematics professors tell you that you have to develop mathematical maturity and mathematical intuition. At the same time, they don't tell you how to do it. If you ask a mathematician how they knew how to do something in their academic paper, sometimes their answer is, the idea just hit me, and they can't tell you anything more than that. What I'm going to do is to show you how you can start building these skills as a mathematician. There isn't one road to do this, but the biggest step is to learn how to attack a proof as you're reading it. I recently had a several hour long argument with a student about how to build intuition and what intuition is. I'll tell you more about that later, but I think the best way to show you how to do this is by example. The theorem and proof I have in mind is from Baby Rudin, or Rudin's Principles of Mathematical Analysis. This is theorem 1.21. It, it is concerned with proving the existence of nth roots of positive real numbers. I taught this in my introduction to analysis course, and embarrassingly, I misunderstood a single line, which led me down the wrong path for a while. What we are going to find is that even though this proof is correct, there are several hidden lemmas that you as a reader have to go prove. This implication has not yet been proven, which means that as a reader, we need to go make sure this is true. When you are approaching a theorem in a textbook, the context is probably the most important thing to establish. Theorem 1.21 comes right after we establish a lot of basic results about ordered fields, and the real numbers were just introduced as an ordered field containing the rationals that has the least upper bound property. Going into the proof, if the book is coherently written, we should expect these results to be used profitably. For instance, these results about inequalities from Proposition 1.18 is going to be used extensively and iteratively throughout the proof. The proof moves to immediately dispatch the uniqueness result by saying that this is clear, since if 0 is less than y1, which is less than y2, then y1 raised to the nth power is less than y2 raised to the nth power. We have already hit a new lemma that we need to prove. Nowhere in the preceding pages did we prove a result like that. What we do know is that if y1 is less than y2, then we can multiply both sides by a positive real number and maintain the inequality. That's proposition 1.18b, by the way. All right, so what we do is we just start with what we know. Uh, y1 is less than y2. And we know that they're both positive. And if we know that they're both positive, then we can use the definition from Rudin that basically says, if you have an ordered field, then the product of two positive elements stays positive. And that's how we're gonna be using the positivity throughout here. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna take both of these elements and we're gonna multiply them by something positive. Uh, y1 is positive, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, we want y1 squared to be less than y2 squared, so we need to have y2 squared come up, so we're gonna do this again. Okay, so now we have this transitive property about inequalities, so that means that since y1 squared is less than y2 times y1, and that same term here is less than y2 squared, then that means that y1 squared is less than y2 squared, is less than y2 squared. So we approve this uh, for not just an arbitrary n, but for uh, squared in particular. So let's see how we can go up to a higher power and then the rest comes down to induction and I'll leave that to you. So now we're gonna go from here and we're gonna get up to y cubed. So I start with this and I'm gonna multiply by y1. So I'm gonna get y1 cubed is less than y2 squared times y1. Now, I can't just take this guy and multiply by y2 because then I'm not gonna have the right cross term. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna go back up to here and I'm gonna multiply both sides by y2 squared. Okay, now we have this cross term here, right? So we have these two ideas that y1 cubed is less than y2 squared times y1. That same term here is there and this is less than y2 cubed. What? Transitivity means that y1 cubed is less than y2 cubed. And there you go. And the rest follows by, say, induction. So here, only one line into this proof, and we already had to make a whole lemma to justify that first implication. Let's read it again. That there is at least one such y is clear, since zero is less than y1, which is less than y2, which implies that y1 to the nth power is less than y2 to the nth power. Okay, that inequality makes sense now. That was tedious to prove, but we are building mathematics up from scratch here. It should get tedious somewhere. How does this get us uniqueness? 
Well, if we had two different positive reals, say y1 and y2, whose nth power was x, then by the definition of ordering, either y1 and y2 are equal, or one is larger than the other. Might as well take y1 as being less than y2. Now we just showed that their nth powers should not be equal, but our assumption was that it should be, and this is a contradiction. So that means that there is at most one y whose nth power is exactly x. All right, line two. I mean, how long has this been already? We're only two lines in. Let E be the set consisting of all positive real numbers t, such that t to the n is less than x. Okay, that's pretty innocuous. We are setting up a collection of numbers and we have some sort of inequality. This is probably gonna lead us to using the least upper bound property of the reals. Uh, we know we would have to use that property because it doesn't work for the rationals and that's an ordered field that doesn't have the least upper bound property. So if anything is gonna make this work, it would have to be that one thing. So what's next? Well, we can declare any set we want, but it might be the empty set. So we have to prove that the set is not empty. Now I have to be honest here. I mean, learning how to read a proof like this took me years. Part of it is from good professors and solid explanations, but most of it was just me in the book and spending hours looking over theorems over and over again. One of the most asked questions on Reddit math is how to build mathematical intuition. Uh, not long ago, a user who I will call Bob on Reddit asked just this question. They felt that their classmates had a better intuition than they did. Bob felt that they were being left behind and were frustrated that their professors didn't teach them how to prove things. Me and another professor both maintained the same thing. It's not something you can really teach. It is something you can acquire from hours and hours of reading proofs of theorems and working on problems. Uh, Bob maintained if an intuition occurs to you, then you must be able to explain it. But truly, we often don't know where our intuition really comes from. The conversation continued in DMs and it turned into this. I really hope Bob has taken my advice to heart, but you can see how frustrated he was and probably still is. Mathematics is really good at making you frustrated. Now let's prove the set E is non-empty. Uh, the rest of the proof is actually pretty smooth sailing after this part, just more familiar algebraic manipulations. I'm embarrassed to say that this line threw me for a minute and I concocted an ultimately needless workaround that I'll tell you about. Rudin introduces us to this real number t, which is x divided by one plus x. Rudin claims that zero is less than t is less than one. We haven't proved that yet. So here's another minor lemma. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to show that this little t we made up is actually bigger than zero, but less than one for positive x. That's not too bad to do. What we do is we go ahead and use this. And so we, we start off with zero being less than x, and that's given to us. And we know that x is gonna be less than x plus one. Now we know that x plus one is bigger than zero, but then uh, there's a proposition that we proved and that tells us that one over x plus one has to be bigger than zero. And so now if we have something that's bigger than zero, then the definition of an ordered field says that if we take the products of positive terms, then they remain positive. So I can multiply these two guys and stay positive. And another proposition we said is that if we multiply both sides of an inequality by a positive term, we maintain the inequality. So we get this inequality here. So then we get x times one over x plus one, that's our t, x plus one times one over x plus one. And we know that basically is one by definition. And so then we get zero is less than x over x plus one, which is less than one. That's it for that proof. Now this next bit is what threw me off. We do need another lemma between this sentence we just read and the next one, but it wasn't as bad as what I thought initially. I'm an experienced analyst, but I thought for a minute that since we have only showed that t is less than one, that Rudin was suggesting that say x is bigger than one. Nowhere in the argument did Rudin say that. We only have that x is bigger than zero. I then scrambled to find out if we can only consider those x's greater than one. Okay, so this was the wrong path I was led to. I believed that Rudin was trying to show that this holds for every x bigger than one, and I was like, oh man, we're gonna have to show that this works for all the x's less than or equal to one as well. So I basically made up this lemma. If for every x bigger than one and n and n, there is a unique positive real y with y to the n is equal to x. So basically the content of the theorem for Rudin, except changing x being positive to x being bigger than one. Uh, then this also is true for zero is less than x is less than or equal to one. And so the proof I did, this is really simple, is basically I say that if x is equal to one, then we know that one to the n is equal to one, that, that's trivial. Uh, if zero is less than x is less than one, 
then basically what we know is that one over x has to be bigger than one, and then there's a positive y such that y to the n is equal to one over x, which is the hypothesis. And then basically I just flip this on its head, so I get one over y to the n is equal to one over one over x, which is equal to x, and then basically you get x is equal to one over y to the n, which can be written as one over y raised to the n, so then that is the nth root. Is it positive? Yes, because if y is positive, then one over y is positive and done. Right, and I thought, man, okay, good, great. I established this for my class. I uh, will be able to confidently tell them this. And uh, yeah, this is fine, it's all true, but it's all unnecessary. It, it, it feels like I sort of wasted time proving this, but at the same time, it, you get to know the material better when you go down a route like this. So I could keep beating myself up about it, but honestly, this is just me doing math. So yes, we could just prove this for x being greater than one and the rest would follow. It's unnecessary if we just prove this one more lemma. So we need to show that t is indeed less than x uh, for any positive x. How would we do this? Well, if we see that t is equal to x times one over x plus one, we already have shown that one over x plus one is a positive real less than one. So what we really want is a lemma that says that for positive x, the real number x times lambda is less than x for lambda, a positive real less than one. This, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, take lambda less than one and proposition 1.18b says that if we multiply both sides by a positive number, we maintain the inequality. So x times lambda is less than x times one, which is just x. Hence, t is less than x. Okay, so that was all pretty tedious, but the point was to show you with a simple example how you have to attack a proof. Uh, you should challenge every line, doubt each statement as it comes up, and hold your ground until you understand it. You might have to put it down and come back later, or you might have to black box a line you don't understand and come back to it after you get through the rest of the proof. However, practicing this will help you catch problems with your own work, which is the hardest thing to do. For the sake of the video, I'm gonna put on the brakes here. Uh, the rest of the proof goes on to establish an upper bound of E, so we know that the least upper bound exists. And then Rudin sets the perspective and nth root to be the least upper bound of the set. After that, Rudin needs to show that this is actually the nth root. So he go shows by way of contradiction that the nth root can't be less than or greater than the least upper bound of E. This is actually kind of cool because he uses some sort of prototype for the mean value theorem on the function f of s is equal to s to the n. We don't have derivatives in the text for another four chapters, so I, I thought this was pretty clever. I hope this helps you understand how you should be reading proofs in your textbooks, uh, particularly in Baby Rudin. If it did, then please hit the like button or drop me a comment below. It's not easy to read a proof, and it's not supposed to be. You have to fight your urge to believe in authority, uh, because doubt is the first step to learning. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope you have a great day.